Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. And then we'll have time to address these questions once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Andrew Harvey. Uh, Andrew is a research fellow at Leiden University Center for Linguistics. And the title of his current funded research is Korwa, Hatsa and Ihansu, Grammatical Increase in the Tanzania Rift Valley Area. His interests include the morphosyntax um, of uh, the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evidenced through linguistic arts and language contact. Please join me in welcoming Andrew as he gives his talk, Verbal Paradigms in Gorwa, Phonological Analysis in Service of a Unified Account. Hello, and uh, thank you, Anna, for the introduction. Uh, today I'm going to talk on a topic that has interested me for quite some time, the, the six inflectional classes of verb subject agreement in Gorwa, and specifically how phonological analysis, analysis allows us to see these six classes as one unified phenomenon. So I'd like to start uh, by briefly introducing the language. Gorwa is a South Cushitic language of the larger Afroasiatic phylum spoken by around 133,000 people in and around Babati district in north central Tanzania. Uh, to give listeners uh, an idea or a quick example of what the Gorwa language sounds and looks like, I have a brief recording of Akobu Sakware telling me about farming sisal uh, when he was a boy. <laughs> Um, so further information about the language can be found in my 2018 dissertation, especially the sketch grammar in chapter two. And further information about the language context and the language as it interacts with the culture can be found in a 2019 paper I wrote for the LDD journal. Uh, this talk is being recorded and will be archived with Zenodo as well as accessible on the Rift Valley Network's YouTube channel. Uh, all the data used in today's talk, that is material of utterance length or longer is openly accessible online at my deposit at the Endangered Languages Archive. Um, material will be listed with a unique identifying number composed of two parts. The alphanumeric code to the left of the full stop corresponds to the unique identifying number of the recording. Um, this uh, can be accessed by entering it into the search bar on the deposit page highlighted here in red. Uh, this will take you to a page where all audio, video, and uh, analysis may be watched, listened to, and freely downloaded. Uh, the number to the right of the full stop corresponds to the utterance number in the recording. As such, the particular utterance can be located in its ALON file uh, by locating the segment with the corresponding number. Uh, the data I'll be using today was collected between 2012 and 2013, and then from 2013 to present. Um, between 2012 and 2013, it was uh, collected as part of a master's uh, degree at the University of Dar es Salaam and funded by Queen Elizabeth Commonwealth Scholarship. Uh, ongoing data collection from 2014 to present has been funded by the Endangered Languages Documentation Program. Uh, by way of introduction to the topic, I think it's fair to say that the morphophonology of Gorwa is fairly complex, uh, taking the form gadae, roughly translated as that thing, uh, for example, what we can see is that it's composed of four distinct segmental morphemes, two of which bear high tone and two of which bear low tone. We can also see an underlying morph O, glossed here as a topic marker, 
with a different surface form, which is in this case conditioned by the tone of the morph which preceded it. Um, verbs are similarly complex. The form gasike is formed of at least four morphemes, each of which uh, has its own segmental and supersegmental phonology. Uh, today, our focus will be specifically on the form highlighted here in red. Uh, one may immediately ask what's so interesting about what looks to be just a bare lexical verb stem. And I have to admit that here I was being rather coy in my glossing. There is more here in this morpheme to be said. I was just very unsure of how to parse it at the time. A better example uh, from the closely related neighboring language, Iraq, is a verb stem being glossed with one, uh, its lexical meaning, and uh, two, the person and number values of its grammatical subject. Martin's gloss here indicates that the respective meanings are fused, uh, not separable in any straightforward way. By the time I gave this particular presentation uh, in 2019 last year, uh, from which the example is taken, I uh, was glossing verbs by giving, them, uh, by giving them in their first person form, then indicating a special morphophonological operation written between tildes. Uh, the pattern itself is given in this table, a pattern I always found stri striking in its parsimony and to an English speaking ear, its subtlety. So first person subject is indicated with a long vowel and high tone, uh, which translates as rising intonation. Second person subject or a third person nominal feminine subject is indicated with a short vowel and high tone. Third person pronominal subject or a third person masculine nominal subject is indicated with a long vowel and a low tone. So thus we have the opposition of ho, ho and ho. Uh, the rest of the paradigm is given here, uh, but as the parsing shows, these forms are mainly derivative of the forms above them. Um, as such, today's talk will focus on the forms highlighted above in red. And as I mentioned, and now written above, we have three verb forms differentiated by the supersegmental properties of vowel length and tone. So we have a long high followed by a consonant, we have short high followed by a consonant, and we have long low followed by a consonant. This pattern, however, is not uh, the pattern with uh, which all verbs employ to mark subject agreement. There are in fact five more. Uh, and before I give them, I'm just going to simplify the table. Uh, it's an interesting syncretism. Forms in these columns are used for sec second person pronominal as well as feminine gender nominal and third person pronominal as well as masculine gender nominal subjects. For the sake of space, I'm going to remove the pronominal signifiers, but here and elsewhere in the presentation, the rule still applies. So feminine gender nominal forms are also the forms used for second person and masculine gender nominal forms are the same used for third person pronouns. So all of the six paradigms along with an example verb are now given. As a note, the forward slash, uh, in column three, for example, is a voiceless pharyngeal fricative uh, and not the indication of two options. I'll pause here for a quick moment so that you can have a bit of a look at these patterns. Uh, and those of you watching uh, the recording afterwards may want to pause here and uh, look a little bit closer. I should note that the translations given here are a bit misleading as um, none of the forms listed here can stand alone as an independent verb form. Gorwa and uh, all the South Cushitic languages are famous for their distributive predicative syntax in which a range of verb-like functions are spread between the lexical verb and a highly fusional element uh, of a complex of clitics uh, known widely in the literature as a selector. That is to say the form hu on its own cannot mean I know. Instead, it must be coupled with its selector. A hu, I know, or I know it. Returning to our inflected verb forms, we, we can now take the steps into an analysis. Um, I assume based on a combination of external evidence as well as gut feeling that the first person is the base form and that feminine and masculine forms are inflected from this first person underlying form. That is, a verb stem undergoes a zero operation to achieve first person. That same basic verb stem undergoes uh, a separate operation to achieve the feminine form. And again, this same underlying form undergoes a third distinct operation to achieve the masculine form. 
As may be seen, uh, whatever the nature of the operation, a primary effect, at least in the inflection classes one to five, is on the final segment. Our analysis can probably start here. Uh, so this is more or less a copy of the consonant inventory of Gorwa in my grammar sketch. Uh, for reasons that will become clear later, I've included the new segment, the pre-nasalized voiced alveolar stop. Uh, starting with inflection class one, we can chart the phonological operations undergone on the consonant chart. So here we can see bo becoming ra in the feminine and wa becoming gu in the masculine. A similar demonstration can be made for inflection class five with he becoming t in the feminine and he staying he, not changing in the masculine. And now we will plot all the forms together. And as you can see, it's a bit of a mess really. Arrows point in various directions across the space making any sort of pattern not very immediately evident. So here we see another version of this consonant inventory, this time organized by sonority, the rather fuzzy notion of how loud sound is in comparison to others in the inventory. And I say that this notion is fuzzy because though it is based on the physical reality of loudness or amplitude, this reality is mediated through both the minds of the speakers as well as idiosyncrasies internal to the language as a system. As such, uh, the sonority hierarchy in Gorwa, uh, arranged here from most sonorous sounds at the top to the least sonorous sounds at the bottom, has some notable departures from the universal scale. The first is the almost vocalic status of R. Uh, this, in fact, has possible correlates in the phonotactics of language. In Gorwa, most all segments can occur word initially, except for vowels. This is somewhat obscured by the writing convention, but all words that are written with a leading vowel are obligatorily preceded by a glottal stop. Hence uh, the noun akesi and the verb oh. In addition to vowels uh, and to the exclusion of all other consonants of Gorwa, a similar no word initial restriction applies to the segment R. In uh, my lexical elicitation, the only forms I have found to begin with R in Gorwa are the place name Riroda of probable Datoga origin and the personal name Riaru of uncertain origin. Uh, the sonority sequencing of H and L, H and R, are also unexpected, both in relation to each other and H's relation to all other sounds. Uh, beginning with H, an explanation may lie in its really highly unspecified nature. It's generally assumed that H lacks manner features, sort of cross-linguistically. It's not a consonant, not a vowel, not a, nor a semi-vowel or glide. It also has no place features, so I assume that it is primarily due to its not being a consonant which sees it falling so close to other highly sonorant non-consonantal segments. L's low sonority in Gorwa is, a in a, is kind of a case of guilt by association. So in verbal subject inflection, ul patterns the same as all non-sonorant consonants. I therefore assume that it must be non-sonorant in Gorwa. So this division is already useful in that all consonants above the red line participate in the phonological operations one through five, whereas all consonants below the red line um, participate exclusively in the phonological operations of six. For the sake of exhaustiveness, none of the nasal forms highlighted here uh, form the end of a verb stem, except perhaps for the velar nasal n, about which we shall discuss later. Returning now to the segments involved in the phonological operations from one to five, we can chart them on a sonority ranked inventory. We begin to see a pattern. So once again, with the red arrows indicating operations triggered by feminine inflection and the blue arrows indicating operations triggered by a masculine inflection, we see that all feminine inflections result in forms that are less sonorant than the base forms. Masculine inflections show less of a certain trend beside labialized forms markedly losing their labialization. And as a quick reminder, this graphic does not account for the operations in six, which don't affect consonants, but affect vowels. All that can be seen with regards to the inflectional class six is that verb stems ending in these forms highlighted will take this pattern. Otherwise, there are few patterns. Operations triggered by the feminine result overwhelmingly in alveolar segments and um, the delabialization of masculine inflection as mentioned above. Other generalizations are less clear. W becoming y can't really be called sonorization, nor can w becoming r be called desonorization. 
H is stricto sensu, not sonorant. So how do we describe its changed T under feminine inflection? Do we call it desonorization? Uh, again, uh, we can see that verbs ending in W uh, actually have two inflectional classes and verbs ending in R and H and some verbs ending in W don't change at all in the masculine inflection. So any sort of deeper analysis will require different ways of structuring the data, I think. So moving from segments, we will now attempt to make sense of these patterns as the manipulation of feature bundles. An early example of this would see the alveolar fricative as displayed here, the instantiation of an unordered array of atoms or features. Uh, a revision of this feature bundle view came in the form of feature geometry, in which features, uh, here written in uh, small letters exclusively, are arranged under the structure of organizing nodes with capital letters at the beginning, like these. Uh, and these highlighted nodes here are primary feature nodes and fall somewhere between organizing nodes and feature nodes. And together they form the feature geometric structure for the sound s. Uh, features are conceived of positively. If a feature in a structure is not present, such as lateral here, it may simply be omitted. Um, where features uh, fall on the hierarchy is a matter of considerable examination. So Piggott, for example, move nasal to a branch of the root node, for example. And again, because s is not nasal, it can be dropped off the structure. This goes for individual features as well as for organizing nodes. Um, similarly, if negatively defined features are omitted, positively defined features are by their very presence there, so they don't need to be indicated with a positive. Um, and so hence the superfluousness of the positive sign. Likewise, if all the features of an organizing node are not present in the structure, um, we can get rid of them. And the uh, organizing node is also superfluous. Um, from, the parsimono, uh, from, the, from the parsimony of private feature, or privative features to the minimality of underspecification, the central question kind of it here is, can we cut any further structure away here? Or you know, on, to ask in a, in a different way, are any other features not central to the most minimal, minimal identification of s, of s? The answer in Gorwa is probably yes, as s is differentiated from sh by being anterior, where sh is distributed. So given there are no segments which are both anterior and distributed in Gorwa, and given that the feature anterior is more common than distributed, one could posit anterior is a default secondary place feature of coronal and distributed uh, is, is, it needs to be expressed. And because we assume coronal uh, to be the default primary place feature, it too may go unspecified. Uh, so compared with de, for example, de may be expressed with a, with a place feature to be filled as default coronal by some sort of default rule at a later stage along with the laryngeal organizing node, which uh, indicates that D is voice. Voice itself is underspecified as the default feature within laryngeal. Um, vowels, as well as consonants, can be expressed in terms of a structured feature hierarchy with vowel place features uh, on their own organizing node subsidiary to contact or to um, consonant place features. Hence the labeling C place and V place. Place features are the same for vowels and consonants, coronal for high vowels, labial for round vowels, dorsal for back vowels, and pharyngeal for the vowel ah. Um, under specification can uh, once more apply for a default uh, vowel place, whereas the organizing node itself must be present. Turning now to the so-called manner features, we can see that the combinations of features such as sonorant or continuant are important for our Gorwa data at hand, though perhaps difficult to use in terms of defining a rule as the W to R case exemplifies. Um, so following Moren's parallel structure model, at least in terms of the manner features, previously unitary idiosyncratic features such as continuant are now deconstructed as part of a manner organizing node where a feature such as open here will represent a fricative. If open is a default feature, it may be underspecified. Um, vowels and vowel-like segments are given special subsidiary nodes as for place. 
and the nodes are named as such. Consonants are defined as such by lacking a vowel manner feature, uh, and semivowels have vowel manner features. Um, in a step beyond Morin and, and roughly along arguments set up by Auden, uh, 2011, is vowels have a T manner um, or tone manner node with a closed feature if their tone is high. Again, this can be underspecified as the default. And, uh, and if the uh, feature under T manner is open, the vowel's tone is low. In addition to this, uh, the research will also adopt elements of Auden's 2006 radical substance-free phonology. And essentially what this means for our analysis today is it maintains that individual languages will set the features of a sound according to how it functions in the language rather than its phonetic reality. So we already touched on this a little bit in looking at how Gorwa sonority differed from the proposed universe, universals. So in terms of feature geometry, this is instantiated in ra being semi-vowel-like with a v manner and v place node, and la being obstruent-like, lacking vo both v manner and v place nodes. And again, a closed v manner can be default. Having spent a bit of time establishing the theoretic basis for the models on which we will rely, we can now actually return to the data. Uh, a fully articulated uh, structure uh, under the feature geometry that we're going to employ looks like this, and crucially with the defaults uh, for Gorwa highlighted in red. So these are the, uh, the elements that when they are blank, it means that they will be inserted as default later. Um, so what I would like to do is go through each inflection class and its feminine and masculine inflection uh, pattern. Uh, from this, we will instantiate and refine the rules of what exactly is going on. So let's start with the pattern class four. So first of all, this rule is r becomes t uh, when we're inflecting for a feminine subject. But I will assume that t is the result of an independent word final devoicing rule and set our target structure as d, d. The structures of both r and d are given here. And for a feature geometry model, a series of changes need to happen for r to become d. I'll posit this as d-link vowel manner uh, node and d-link vowel place node. These two operations, plus the independent word final devoicing rule, derive the r t operation. For the masculine subject inflection, it's impossible to tell because there is no change, so we can't really posit any rules at this point. Moving on to inflection class five, the most striking characteristic is how unspecified H is. It is so undefined uh, that, uh, in fact, that the previous two rules proposed for feminine inflection in class four cannot apply. But still, there must be a process by which P becomes T. As such, we composite an arrangement of floating features, a closed C manner and C place. And through a process of feature spreading, uh, they impart their features to uh, the uh, H structure. It's important to identify that these features have no root node and therefore have no phonetic realization apart from their, those instantiated after their spread to a root. So basically, this rule worked appropriately uh, for inflection class five feminine, but in order to be general, we need now to go back and see if it is still applicable to the data in inflection class four. So here we see all of the rules applied, and as shown before, delinking the vowel manner node and delinking the vowel place node are possible, and indeed are what result in r becoming t. Uh, the new feature spreading rule also applies, but does not succeed in spreading features. C manner and C place are already filled in this structure, and as such, the rules are present, but they are inert, or the structure is inert to it. So the rules are still valid, it's just that the, the structure makes those rules uh, unable to apply in this case. Um, returning to inflection class five, we can now look at the masculine inflection uh, for inflection class five. So in this case, there is no change to the final consonant, once again. However, there is a change to the tone of the final vowel. High tone becomes low tone. The only way to achieve this here, at least in my uh, system that I've set up, is to posit a floating open feature, which spreads to the T manner node. 
Because its closed feature is only filled as a default, the tmanner node is vacant uh, to be filled by spreading operations. And as such, we have developed the first rule for masculine inflection, spreading. And um, returning to the inflection class four to check to see if this rule makes sense, we can see that spreading should be able to occur in this structure, specifically to the v manner node, but it does not. Uh, this is counter evidence to our proposed rule, but we're going to stick with it and see if we can uh, make it work in other, uh, in other examples. So proceeding to inflection class one, one cannot attempt an analysis without first disentangling it with inflection class two. After all, both take a verb ending in w and seemingly perform two different operations on it. In fact, I will argue that we are dealing with two different kinds of w. One of them is a glide and the other is part of a diphthong. Um, we will deal with the diphthong, uh, the form in the inflection class one first. So because it is part of a diphthong, I assume that this segment forms part of a vowel and is vocalic itself. It has a vowel manner and a vowel place feature and can bear tone, hence the tone manner node. Um, slightly modifying the formulation of the rule, uh, the lowest place related node here, labial, is delinked. However, following the next delinking rule, delink v manner, will not result in the proper structure for the r segment that we want to end up with. Um, instead, we will modify the rule uh, to say delink the lowest manner organizing node. This targets the right part of the same structure. So spreading the from the floating structure, uh, in this case, a closed feature to the uh, manner proceeds. Um, returning to check our rule modifications on the inflection class four, we can see that the wording change results in no change uh, to where this in the structure it's targeted. And our rule is okay thus far. Similarly, in inflection class five, the, the delinking rules cannot apply and the change of wording does not upset the operation. Um, returning again to inflection class one, this time for masculine subject agreement operations, uh, spreading of the posited open manner feature to V manner is blocked by the structure. It is similarly, if inexplicably, also blocked from influencing tone at T manner. So that's not excellent uh, news for our rule, uh, but let's, uh, let's continue all the same. I suppose the one difference between the two structures is in fact that uh, the masculine inflected form has a dorsal v place feature, whereas the base form does not. As such, if we posit a floating dorsal feature, which may spread to occupy v place with the pre-existing labial feature, this results in the desired structure. Uh, returning to inflection class four to check to see if this will make sense in other inflection classes, we see that in addition to the inexplicable non-spreading of the open feature to the vowel manner feature, the uh, dorsal feature does not spread even though its structure uh, should allow it to. Um, so that's a little bit of a question mark. Uh, for inflection class five, applying the same masculine revised rule, it seems more plausibly okay with the, with the non-dorsal feature in addition to accepting the spread of an open manner feature. The uh, dorsal place feature is properly blocked uh, by the structure, allowing the feature to be present but inert. Moving now to inflection class two, the w with which verbs end is different. It is not a diphthong and cannot bear tone. It does not have a vowel place. It's labial, uh, primary place feature has a secondary round place feature. So applying this uh, to the feminine inflection, uh, all rules apply without needing adjustment. V manner delinks to the lowest manner organizing node, round delinks as the lowest place node, and the floating feature arrangement spreads a closed manner feature to consonant manner. Uh, masculine inflection operations for inflection class two are similarly uncontroversial. So there is no change between the segments. And this is reflected in the structure's inertness to the floating feature arrangement proposed. So we can't see open move to uh, the consonant manner place. We can't, see it, uh, we can't see it spread to the vowel manner place. And uh, we can't see dorsal moving to the consonant place either. 
The penultimate inflection class is class three. Uh, the feminine inflectional operation is again well described by the rules that we have so far defined. So we see a delinking at the lowest manner organizing node that that works. Uh, we also see a delinking at the lowest place node. And then we see uh, that spreading is blocked by the structure. Um, whereas the masculine inflectional operation requires some further qualification. Uh, the floating open manner feature is expectedly uh, blocked from spreading. Uh, at face value, the dorsal feature also appears blocked from spreading. This situation is undesirable for two reasons. The first being that the resulting phoneme, uh, the alveolar nasal n has a default coronal feature, while the base phoneme, the bilabial nasal m has a labial feature. How the labial comes to be lost and how the coronal is acquired is not at all clear. And as such, I would propose an alternative. I'm going to propose that the labial feature is in fact lost through a process of fusion with the dorsal feature and the dorsal feature is present on the final structure, which in fact is not n, but ng. Evidence for this can be garnered in a special set of deverbal nouns, which was uh, given to me during a series of elicitations uh, as the so-called plural forms of deverbal nouns. So for example, we have the verb da, which is to skin an animal. It nominalizes it as dagaro, skinning an animal. The plural of this form I was given was dakang, meaning skinning animal, skinning animals habitually. Uh, there are many more examples with similar semantics. So while these forms are plural in a sense, what they can most accurately be described as are nominalizations of the durative forms of the original verbs, with the durative extension being the exact model of class three verbs. Uh, what's interesting here is that the form of the durative suffix takes, its, takes the velar nasal n rather than the alveolar n. This does not appear to be an effect of the nominalizing suffix u, as other stems ending in n, uh, the alveolar nasal, may take it without any sort of velarizing effect, as uh, kanu highlighted. It doesn't become kang with that u uh, ending, it stays kanu. So where is that velarizing coming from? Uh, I argue that it's actually the base, uh, the base form of third person. Uh, in this uh, in this inflection uh, class. So I therefore use this as evidence for an underlying velar nasal in the masculine subject inflection operation for class three with uh, a develarization and alveolarization as a result of some independent synchronic or historical process. And finally, uh, the pattern uh, the patterns that we're going to look at are those of class six. So the large class, including all of the non sonorant consonants of Gorwa, with the exception of H, of course, which was discussed above. Um, following Moren, these sounds are structurally similar in feature geometry in that they all lack a vowel manner node. In the feminine uh, subject agreement inflection, the process begins with a long high-toned vowel and produces a short high-toned vowel. The preceding consonant, perhaps because of its lack of uh, vowel manner and vowel place features, seems transparent to this operation. Uh, place linking, manner uh, delinking, and feature spreading all do not apply. Instead, actually, what we see is that the delinking occurs not in the feature structure, but at the level of the mora, with a mora delinked and deleted from the vowel. I guess conversely, and perhaps the delinking rule is still present, but and does still delink at the lower, at the lowest manner organizing node, which in this case is tone manner. This would effectively turn the vowel into a sonorant consonant, and perhaps it is this operation which is affecting the vowel length. Uh, but with that said, there is no resulting sonorant consonant, so this is rather unlikely or an insufficiently explored explanation. Um, Masculine inflection is an easier process for class six in which a long high toned vowel becomes a long low vowel. This could be straightforwardly explained by the spreading of the open manner feature to the tone manner node, rendering the resultant vowel feature really low. In terms of conclusions, because I know that we're running on time here now, um, 
I suppose this talk attempted to unite a group of formally disparate morphophonological operations by appealing to a relatively abstract set of properties under a machinery called featured geometry. This was successful in many regards, but unsuccessful in others. So the vowel focused operations in class six are somewhat different from the others and existing rules seem somewhat ill-equipped or possibly improperly defined to generalize over them, even if the operations are somewhat germane as we just saw. Um, for example, we also see these R to R operations for masculine inflection in class four were sort of woefully unsuccessfully described, leading me to think that my structures for the segment uh, are maybe inaccurate. Um, in terms of other conclusions, I found it quite strikingly that if we were to construct phonological segments from these floating features discovered, uh, they would correspond with T for feminine operations and O for masculine operations. And of course, the Cushitacists among us should be very pleased indeed to see these useful, these usual suspects doing what they usually do. Um, and, and the story to this is these forms are very much, uh, you know, you would see T is a good old Afroasiatic marker of and O is, you know, it's a more recent Cushitic reflex of masculine gender. Uh, these forms are very much on the extreme end of Hain and Kuteva's erosion stage of grammaticalization. We don't even see an independent segment remaining. We just see a pair of floating features or nodes from the original morphine. Um, thank you. And, and, and basically from a descriptive account, um, I think that there's very little chance that a grammar would give up using the six inflectional classes in favor of a feature spreading account. But with that said, the exercise did throw up some unavoidable truths, including two or possibly three new segments for the Gorwa inventory. Uh, and theoretically, I suppose, the data pushes feature geometry to its state of the art and forces us to look at the patterns under our noses in a very new way. Thank you for uh, listening to my presentation and um, here are my references. Thank you for this really interesting talk, Andrew. Um, so if anyone has a question or comments, they can write it in the chat module of Zoom. Um, and to give everyone some time to start writing, uh, I'll start with a question of my own. Uh, it's, it's regarding the W, uh, which you classified both as a diphthong and a glide. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, um, so do you find the glides after an A ever, after the vowel A? So you will all uh, you'll always see the diphthong, but you can actually, yes, you can actually find that vowel after A. So it's not just simply that um, that glide do, does not occur uh, or will occur with every other sound but A. You can also have sounds in AW taking that glide uh, class. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, first of all, I have a quick comment by Bonnie Sens, who says, nice analysis. Um, and afterwards, I have a question by uh, Richard. He says, thanks for the stock, Andrew. Are, are these patterns exactly the same in Iraq, or are there differences? I see slight differences. Um, you know, I haven't looked at the Iraq super, super closely, but I, I know, for example, that in, in Gorwa, you would say, um, if you were to inflect the verb to eat, which is I, um, you would get uh, you would get I uh, for the for first person I I eat or I am eating so that would be I and then you get for second person you get I and then for third person you would get I so it's the, it's the same sort of pattern as um, as the plosives which is kind of surprising really um, and doesn't figure into uh, my analysis here. Whereas in Iraq, I believe what you get is you get I, and then for second person, you get ag, where the Y turns into a G sound. And for third person, I think you get I again, but I think that, um, I think that Martin would have to uh, back me up on that. I think I've maybe one more of my own, but um, I'm still a little bit dazzled by all the different trees you showed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think you said that you um, stipulated the um, high tone was the default tone. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Is that for the whole system or would you say just within the verbal paradigms? No, actually, I think that I think that high tone. Um, so I need to be careful here. Yeah, I think that at least within the verbal paradigms, high tone is the uh, default. Uh, but I think that within within the uh, nominals, you would see low tone and high tone would be marking Depending on the suffix, high tone will be marking possession. All right, thank you. I have one more question, I think, from Richard. He says, uh, could you conceivably reconstruct historical stages of feature geometry rules processes through comparative analysis? Hmm. I'm trying to think about what this would look like. Um, we have sort of a nice laboratory in that we have these four South Cushitic languages, of course, you know, the time that was, that lay between Alagua and Gorwa, for example, is quite large, whereas with Iraq, uh, the time uh, depth is much, much smaller, probably two to three hundred years. So you could probably see much more recent stuff going on. And I know that I know that, for example, Roland Kiesling did some fantastic reconstructions of different um, of different phonological processes. And I mean, if it's phonological, it should be representable through um, through feature geometry. So yeah, I think that that's I think that that's a complete possibility. I don't know if that answered your question. What criteria did you use to classify inflections into six paradigms? I see that from uh, Crispina. Yeah, that's um, right. So basically what I used to classify the inflections into six paradigms were how they behaved. So I'd like to go, I'll go back if I can. Oh gosh. If I can go back to one of my, yeah, here we are. I can go back to my chart here. So what we have in this graphic is we have verbs that behave in six different ways according to how you how you um, how you inflect them. So we have verbs that begin in W that become R and Y. We have verbs that um, begin with W in first person that become P and W in the third person. So we have, we have basically six different patterns when we're inflecting. So that gives me six different paradigms. There you go. Um, so Bonnie Sun says, I'm very interested in the idea of L as a non-sonorant. I've seen uh, Root 2016 uh, argue for sonorant obstruents. So it stands to reason one might also have obstruent sonorants. Um, root days. Yeah, I mean, it seems, it seems like, uh, it seems like most of these operations between class one and five, sort of their major target is this V manner node. So, so there's an R, there, there's a, there's a, there's an operation that's targeting the sonorous nature or the, or the, yeah, the more sonorous nature or sonorant nature of these sounds. And then everything else that doesn't have a sonorant, um, feature will fall into this class six. And so in class six, this is where a lot of the L, well, I, all of the L uh, ending um, verbs uh, will fall. So we have verbs like, we have verbs like bal, which is to defeat, uh, becoming bal and uh, bal. Uh, so we have a very clear sort of pattern. Um, it's, it's very, very black and white. And Bonnie says, if L is velarized, that's more evidence it has a second set of place features. Oh, that's very interesting. I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at that or thought of that. I don't know if it is, to be honest, Bonnie. Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I could, I could take a look at that. Yeah, so I have a, a comment from Crispina. She asks, uh, how is Kanu related to Kang? I did not catch the, this well. So in fact, there is no relationship between Kanu and Kang. Uh, basically, I was I was representing. Let me see if uh, here it is. I was representing uh, how Kanu looks, so the word for tendon, uh, versus how it should look if we say that the U 
uh, that nominalizing ending if that makes um, n velarized. And of course it doesn't. So I've put the asterisks there saying that this is, a, this is an ungrammatical result from, from uh, suffixing this u onto the, no, onto the stem con. So uh, there, is no, um, there is no relation between kanu and kang. Um, but what I'm showing here is that uh, it looks like the um, velarized nasal is underlying in the third person here rather than the alveolar uh, nasal. And in um, fact, I know, I, know that, I know that in Iraq, there's a word kang, which means matter or language. Uh, in Gorwa, that word does not exist at all. There is no word kang in uh, Gorwa. I have another comment from uh, Lizzie Poole who says, I think there are Bantu languages too where the velar nasal is the default instead of the more common alveolar. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Lizzie, do you know if any of those are, uh, are in the area or are these sort of more distant Bantu languages? No idea. <laughs> Fair enough. We don't. Um, so Crispina Alphonse asked, in which paradigms of inflections do the borrowed verbs fall? So uh, Crispina, it all depends on it all depends on where you uh, on what you put at the end here of the verb. So often I find bo borrowed verbs will uh, they'll end in uh, the nasal here, um, or they'll end in uh, or they'll possibly end in the s somus. Uh, so if they end in s, so so for example, we will have something like um, to study um, uh, the uh, the the um, a, a very popular form uh, to to say in Gorwa, for example, is um, somim, which is of course soma from uh, from Bantu or from Swahili. And then what you do is you put a class three ending on the end, which is a durative ending. So it becomes so meme. And basically you uh, inflect that as so meme, I study, so mean, uh, you know, you study or a feminine thing studies. And then you have so mean, which is, which is a masculine thing studies. Uh, if you have us, which is you can also see these uh, you can see these uh, um, uh, borrowings uh, nativized with a u u s at the end, which is another form of extension in uh, Gorwa. It's a causative actually, so you can say somus, and I believe that that's uh, to teach. It's to cause to study, um, very similar to what you'd see in Swahili. Uh, in that case, you have a you have a um, you have a non sonorant fricative at the end, you have an S. So in that case, it's going to behave as class six. Um, so that just leads me to thank both you, Andrew, for the very interesting presentation. Of course, everyone who participated and for all these questions and comments. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next presentation in the webinar series will be given on Wednesday, May 20th by Richard Griscom, and it's titled Our Tongues Are Rare, the Mysterious Doroba Language Known as Omayo. Uh, and with that, I would just like to thank Andrew once again for his presentation, of course, to everyone else for participating today, and I hope to see you again at our next webinar.